Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Viking Code School Codecast series. My name is Art Trotman. I'm the founder of Viking Code School. And we are an online web development school which teaches beginners to become job ready. And uh, with us today, we have Greg Camrad, who is a uh, once upon a time corporate warrior who, who got into data science and uh, managed to, uh, he, he went through an accelerated program uh, locally here in San Francisco and managed to parlay that experience through a very rigorous uh, job search process into a, a job currently working as a senior growth analyst at uh, Salesforce. And so, Greg, uh, welcome, uh, welcome here. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, yeah, I, I know that you, you have a whole lot to, to talk about, so uh, sure. I'll, I won't hold you back. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, th first of all, thank you very much, Eric. And uh, I guess um, I guess we should start off a little bit about myself and where this whole presentation came around. Um, uh, like Eric was saying, I started off in the finance world, and I took about two years to figure out that it wasn't for me. And I slowly started to make a transition into the data science world. And the way that that worked is, I like you know like learning like le learning anything new. You pick up one piece of material, it interests you. You pick up another piece of material, you're interested, and you start just keep on going that down that route. And it finally got to the point when these cool new technical things. Because you have to keep in mind here, I didn't come from a technical side either. So I was doing I was an Excel monkey, my uh, <laughs> the first half of my career, and um, so the most coding I did was, you know, if this, then that, in this, then inside some Excel. Anyway, um, got into it and got to the point when it was almost consuming me. Like, I was so interested in it. And my girlfriend at the time, she said, Greg, you should start, you should try to take this a little bit more serious. And I never really can consider it until she said so. And I said, yeah, you know, let me look into it. And I ended up joining Galvanize in July of 2015, their Data Science Immersive, which was a 12-week full-time program. And I graduated... Uh, beginning of July-ish, 2015, and I was definitely in a in a money crunch for sure. Um, you know, the program cost money. I wasn't working, and I didn't have a whole lot saved up. And so, I was very, very, very motivated to get this job search underway. And what that meant was, is after the program, I would spend most of the waking hours, you know, at least eight or nine hours a day, going at this job search. And it took about, um, call it a month and a half-ish of going very hard at this job search. And then finally, uh, I ended up working out a job with Salesforce on their product data science team, being a growth analyst over here. And I've been at Salesforce for about a year now. It's been awesome. And I'm excited to spend much more time here and keep on learning. Uh, right, the interesting part is right after I got done with the job search, I was like a kid who just got done playing video games for 24 hours straight, drinking Coke and Red Bull, because I was so wired, but not in video games, but in the job search sense. So we're talking emails, phone screens, interviews, um, seeing what works, what doesn't work. And I was so knowledge heavy, I had this big job weight on my head. I asked uh, Katie Kent, who works at Galvanize, I said, hey, I have, so, I have so much in my head right now. I have to drop some knowledge on some students. If you think it'd be awesome, if you think it'd be a helpful lesson, I don't mind putting together some PowerPoint, um, a PowerPoint presentation and uh, showing, sharing this material. She said, Greg, I think that'd be great. And so in August of 2015, I came and I shared this presentation, which I'm going to share with you guys today. Cool. cool. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And I'm going to... I'm not going to go through it quickly, but I'll kind of go through it with a little bit of haste. And so, please, anybody, um, ask any questions along the way. No need to wait till the end. If not, we'll just get through it, and we'll just uh, ask some questions from there. Cool. And and actually, as a note for anyone who's out there who's who's viewing on the Hangout or will be viewing, um, we do have the Q&A app, which, which you can use to ask questions, and we'll be able to see those and get to those. And if you're here locally, of course, you can just unmute yourself and feel free to fire away whenever you want. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. And so I want to I want to kind of put a PSA out there. This is geared towards uh, the data science world, but in all actuality, this is what I've learned. It's for it's for a lot of jobs. It's for a lot of technical jobs, and the kind of things we talk about here can be applied all over the place. And so, if you ever see anything data science e, just try to apply it to your specific situation. Awesome. So let me share my screen here. Eric, I'm going to look to you to confirm you got it. You got it? We are, yep. Awesome. Here we go. Beautiful. 
All right, so let's jump into it. So lessons learned the hard way, data science interviews. And first of all, thank you very much again, Eric, for letting me come and present this. I'm excited to be here. And let's get into it. So first, I want to sh oh, first let me talk about myself. So like I said, my name is Greg Camera, and I attended Galvanize you know, last year, 2015, April to July. And right now, I'm a senior analyst on the product data science team here at Salesforce. Um, I attended Zipan, which has turned into Galvanize, now here at Salesforce. And there's a nice little headshot of me. Let's see. Okay. So next, first I want to put the data right in front of you guys. Here is a summary of what I went through during the month while I was searching for a job. And this is, well, let's just jump into it. So first, I sent out 105 uh, emails to people. And so these are distinct people. So individual, um, individual I guess individual uh, technical recruiters and analysts and people like that. I ended up getting in contact with about 31 recruiters. So out of the 105, 31 of them converted, uh, one third of them converted, which was, uh, I was happy with that ratio. From the 31 recruiters, I passed only about 13 of them. And so about one third of them as well. And from the technical and team members, I got five take home tests. And so in the data science world, this is just, you know, here's a data set. Basically tell us what you think about it, or here's some business questions we want you to solve. With those five take home tests, I ended up talking to about six hiring managers. And from there, after talking to the six hiring managers, I had three on sites. And of those three on sites, we landed one offer. Um, and some extra information that's kind of nice to have on there is I ended up talking to about 63 unique companies. Um, 40 of them responded back to me, which was nice. And I counted a no as a response. And so I physically heard back from 40 companies. And once I got this offer, there's still 10 more interviews in process. And so this is either a phone screen, a, a team member screen, a hiring manager screen, or something like that. I, I, I don't want to interrupt your flow, but, sure. but um, I think the sound quality got a little degraded when you did the screen share. Do you think it might be possible to just sort of un unshare and reshare or something? Sure. Let's try that out. We, we went a little bit robot mode. Sure. Uh, sounds good. Let's yeah. see. Let's try. Let's, let me try doing oh. just. Yeah, the sound, the sound quality is not ideal, but um, I, great. Can, can the rest of you guys hear it? Okay. Yeah, hear it well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, let's let's just carry on. Carry on. Sorry about that. Let me share this. And Eric, you got the screen. Yep. Awesome. So the first thing I'm gonna call it here is from a from a job perspective, from a funnel perspective, 105 emails and 31 recruiters to one job offer. This is the first thing that kind of blew my mind, and this was not that uncommon across the rest of my um, uh, schoolmates as well. So just keep in mind these ratios, and the key takeaway here is that there actually is a ton and a ton of work that goes into getting this job offer. And even though it was a lot of work, what I told myself was, Greg, yeah, that's a lot of work, but you're not going to be lazy because you have your goal, and your goal is to get a freaking job. So you got to work hard to get it. Awesome. <laughs> Two quotes that I want to call out here. The first one is one of the data scientists that I talked to. His name was Robin. He says, Greg, finding a data scientist is hard. Hiring one is harder. So there aren't that many data scientists around, and so finding one is hard. But even once you find the data scientist, hiring him is going to be a whole lot harder. This speaks to how hard the funnel is to pass in the first place. And second, a quote that really spoke to me during this process was from a VP at Salesforce, actually. His name is Hernan. He says, Craig, if I wanted an XYZ data scientist, I'd go grab one off the street. But I don't. I need somebody like you. And in my specific situation, what he was speaking to was, Greg, if I wanted a PhD data scientist, with a PhD in stats and a whole bunch of years of experience, I'd go grab one off the street. I'd go find one, but I don't. I need someone like you. The main takeaway with this is a lot of people think that there's a mold that they need to fit, and that's not necessarily the case because it's really hard to be somebody that you're not, It, but it's a lot easier to find a situation that perfectly matches your skills. And one of the main lessons I like to tell people is don't fake who you are because recruiters, it's their job to find out the people who are faking. It's a lot easier to find that position that's going to be right for you. 
Awesome. So now getting into more. So the takeaways. We're going to go over three things. One is organizing and following up. Two, we're going to make everyone's job a whole lot easier. And three, we're going to talk about hard creative energy. <clears throat> Back when I was doing finance, I was, you know, I was searching for kind of a new career, a new job, a new anything. And what I was doing is I was sending out a lot of job applications trying to get out of my current finance role. And what I was doing was sending out these front door applications. And what I mean by front door applications is I would go to, say, um, you know, Airbnb.com, go to the career page, look at the careers on there, find like eight or nine of them, see which ones I liked, and then just blast out my resume to whoever, wh whoever would take it. And I would do very little reaching out. And by reaching out, I mean sending out emails or trying to get introductions to people. And what I found was it was, uh, well, I mean, bluntly, it, it sucked. I mean, the ratios were absolutely horrible, and I would never know where the heck in the process or the funnel I was with these job offers. And it wouldn't tell me anything. Once I did this data science uh, job interview process, I switched things out completely, absolutely flipped it around. And what I did was is I spent most of my time doing reaching out, and I spent very, very few, um, not very, few um, very little of my time doing these front door applications. Now, we'll, we'll get into this, but the main takeaway here is that it's very easy to send out these front door applications. And because it's so easy, that means everyone and their mothers is doing it. And no one's getting these introductions and these warm intros, which I'm going to be talking about a little bit later. But now I want, to st I want you guys to start thinking in the mindset of like, okay, if I'm going to be getting in contact with this technical recruiter, do I have a better chance of submitting my resume online with 400 other people? Or do I have a better chance of emailing them directly and hopefully getting a response and then hearing my pitch? We'll get into that. Cool. Next. So this was the process that I put around a year ago when I first made this pre presentation. And this was the very rough funnel that I saw in my head. Sourcing means you find the companies that you want, and then you pitch the companies that you want, meaning you like make your pitch about your value proposition, about why you'd be an awesome employee. And then finally, you go into your interview. Um, but now that I've been at Salesforce for a year, and I've been on phone screens, I've been on interview panels, I've you know looked at a whole bunch of different people, I've realized that the process is a little bit more, um, we'll call it granular or technical, uh, not technical. Um, well, well, we'll just get into it. It's a little bit more of a funnel, to be honest with you. And the way that I like to see this, <laughs> keep in mind, I do I, I do growth now for a living, and so <laughs> this is kind of a growth funnel, but think of it as a job interview funnel about the different stages and steps of a job interview. First, you're going to have to get the gatekeeper's awareness. This talks about getting in front of that technical recruiter or getting that person to refer you in or something along those lines. It's getting simple awareness on the other side about your application. Next, just because they know about you, just because they know about you doesn't mean that they're going to convert you, meaning that they're going to send you off to the next level. But then if you get past these two steps, you're going to get over to a technical recruiter. Once you get past the technical recruiter, you're probably going to get yourself over to a team member on the team that you're applying for. After you talk to a team member, they're going to give you the thumbs up. They're going to send you off to the hiring manager. After the hiring manager talks to you on the phone and they think that you're cool, they're going to send you over to the final round, which is either an on-site or a project presentation or, you know, a take home test and then a final round or something like that. And after you pass the final round, you're going to get your job offer from there. And the, what, I, what I want to convey here is that each one of these stages, there's different things that you could be doing. So whether it's sending out emails and you say, okay, Greg, I sent out a thousand emails, but only one person responded. Okay, well that tells me that the pitch within the email, your value proposition, that is the part that we need to work on because it's not working. And so if you're, people always ask, you know, Greg, I'm having troubles in the job interview process, I say, okay, are you getting enough phone screens? And they'll say, yeah, I'm getting enough phone screens, but I'm not getting passed off to the next round. It's like, okay, well let's talk about your phone screen strategy and let's see where we can go from there. I'll make sure that I pass this funnel off to you guys later, but when you're thinking about your own job process interview, think about where in the funnel you're stuck and what you need to do to get past that stage in the funnel. Cool. Next. So now we talk about the sourcing. When I, when I talk about the sourcing um, topic, I'm talking about 
finding who the heck to contact in the first place. Who do you, which gatekeepers do you want to talk to? Which people do you want to have convert you? Or simply, which companies are you interested in? And the fact is that a lot of folks coming out of um, technical boot camps, uh, much like I did, much like I think a lot of you are, or a lot of job seekers in general, you know, the, sometimes the company doesn't matter as much necessarily. They're just looking to get into a place, apply some really good energy, and learn. So if you can have a wide range of companies to do that in, where do you find that wide range of companies? This is where I had my personal big list. And so what I did was I first, first off made kind of a... Um, Call it scratch paper. I opened up a big Excel document and I wrote down all the coolest companies that I don't work for. So we're talking our Ubers, our Airbnbs, our you know LinkedIn's, uh, Lyfts, uh, you know Microsofts, Oracle's, all those guys. And I just made the big list there. Next, I went to a lot of the VCs in the area. A ton of VCs have websites where you can just get com get their portfolio companies. And I'd research these por portfolio companies and say, oh, they seem like they'd have cool data. They seem like they'd have a cool experience to work for. I'm going to try them. Um, alternative data science in industries, I mean just remove the word data science from here, but alternative industries. A lot of people think that we need to get in roles where they're tech driven, um, technology driven. So oh, they need to be in Silicon Valley or oh, they need to you know, be in uh, New York with Silicon Alley or something like that. But I was looking at oil and gas industries, uh, commodity industries and all these other guys. So don't have such a narrow scope and think that it has to be in tech. It's just usually the norm. <clears throat> and because I wasn't closing out any options at all, I was contacting staffing and recruiting agencies. So there's literally people who you give your resume to and they don't get their money until you get a job. And so if somebody wanted my resume to try to get me more job um, impressions, absolutely. So I was contacting staffing agencies. I was looking on Hacker News, who's hiring all the time and you know for every single month and filtering on data science jobs. Uh, in fact, I think there's something like 200 different job listings on Hacker News, not even August 15, but in uh, July 2016, there was over 200 job interviews. There's a whole lot of cool stuff on there. And then finally, Data Tau, which is like a Hacker News for data science. And the main goal here is that you want to start with a huge, huge list, just a very expansive, huge list of any company that could maybe interest you, and then pluck and prune it based off of your... Um, your priorities from there. Even make a prioritization list where you're, the ones you want to contact are at the top, the so-so ones are down at the bottom. Cool. So now that you have this big list of companies, you need to organize and follow up, which means if you send out 20 different job applications, how the heck are you going to keep track of all 20 that you sent out? Or say you emailed 50 different people, how are you going to organize all of these emails that you sent out? And me coming from an Excel background, being an Excel monkey, I naturally went straight to Excel and I put in all these different companies into Excel spreadsheet. So I had, I think, something like 120 companies I was interested in and wrote column A right here. And I put a rating by them. So, okay, Airbnb, I kind of want to work for them. Let me give them a five or a 10, whatever scale you want to do. And you say, affirm, eh, maybe not so much. You put in a two or a three. But this way, I could kind of see where I wanted to prioritize my efforts any notes that I wanted to keep on the company, the URL to keep handy, and then say there was a job posting that I was specifically interested in, I put that URL right here. This is a part of a resource, uh, not drop, but a resource document that I'll give you guys after this uh, uh, presentation as well, so I'll give you guys this. And it has 120 companies of people that I was interested in, so you guys can get some inspiration from there. Cool, and then here was my uh, email and interview tracker. So on the left here, I had every single email that I sent out to somebody. And then on the right, I had all of my uh, job interviews and ones that were in progress. And here's the funnel that I showed you guys earlier today. So 150 emails sent out. I simply just counted all the emails that I entered right here. All the recruiters. Uh, that means this. That means it got over into my pipeline, over in my job pipeline. I, if I submitted an application, I put in an entry right here. Then. Did I get to a recruiter? Yeah, I did. Okay, cool. Put an X right there. So like Instacart, for example, I submitted an uh, application and I was rejected, rejected straight up. No big deal, whatever, but I, just, I didn't put an X there for those guys. And I forget where I first learned it, but somebody said something like, you should seek to get you know, 50 rejections from companies. And I was like, what are you talking about? I don't want to get rejected from 15 companies. And they go, no, 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 Greg. You have to understand that the funnel is so wide that 
conversion rates aren't that great for companies, you should seek to go through so many companies and just get that rejection so that you're making forward progress from there. And so I kind of thought about it. I was like, okay, I, I guess that kind of makes sense. And so even if I thought I was going to be rejected from somewhere, I submitted an application. I tried my best because there was a lot of instances and cases where I got on that extra phone screen or I got that extra interview where it gave me more practice and I could see where I wanted to focus my efforts. And here, I don't mind showing all like all the companies that I applied to and all the ones I got rejected because this just shows the work that went into this process and how much work it actually takes to you know get past these um, different stages of the funnel. And I'll give you the, I'm giving you guys this as well too. So not only the company list, but then also the email and interview tracker as well at the end of this um, talk. Cool. So now pitching. So after you send out these a ton of emails, what? Like what goes into the body of the email? Because you can't just say, "Hey, I want a job. Please put me to the right person." Nobody's going to take you seriously. What I want to go over here is how do you get the attention of the right person? Who is the right person? And then what the heck can you do to reduce the friction on their end? Cool. So the pitching process. Here you have your company list. This is my list of 120 companies I was interested in. And then from there, I went and I looked. At LinkedIn, I said, who are the technical recruiters at those companies? Who are the data scientists at those companies? I mean, basically just apply this to your industry. Who's the web developer at those companies that I want to have their job? Like I want to, you know, they seem like they've lost the job. I want to be doing that. And then from there, I had that list of people. And then I put in my email pitch from them. And you can see we have quotes around the email pitch. And it's on all titles because it's, uh, it's uh, the ominous email pitch. It's like, what the heck goes in there? Awesome. So first thing is, what you got to do is you have to find the gatekeeper. So this is the people at the companies that are going to be forwarding off your application to the correct technical recruiter. Now, what I want to take, what I want, what I want you to take notice here is I haven't said the word application through the front door at all. I haven't even, I haven't even mentioned going to the career page. I haven't even mentioned checking if there was a job op opening that you wanted. To me, honestly, I didn't even care if there's a job opening. I just wanted to get in front of that technical recruiter because they know the ecosystem the best, and they're going to see which job posting, if any, my background fit best. I wasn't going to bucket myself into something that maybe not, wouldn't have been a right fit and I would have gotten rejected for. So once you have your list of companies, you want to find these technical recruiters. And so usually you're just going to go to LinkedIn and just type in you know, Instacart technical recruiter and you'll get a list of 20 technical recruiters on there, which is great. Um, but after about a week of doing this, you're going to find out that LinkedIn has a querying limit, unfortunately, because they don't want you abusing their service and they want you to pay for their premium. But simply, if you here's a little trick that I learned, is if you go to Google and you type in site colon LinkedIn.com and then type in your LinkedIn query, you'll get all the Google results, which are pre cached and they update it all the time. And you can see all the LinkedIn results within Google, and then you just click on those guys from there. So that's a nice little uh, pro tip, I guess. <clears throat> and then when you're reaching out to these gatekeepers, if you're going to a really large company, you're going to want to try to get in front of a technical recruiter because they have technical recruiters in place to deal with people like us reaching out. If you're going to a smaller company, say a startup where it's you know six, seven people, eight people, or less than 20 people, you're usually going to want to reach out to somebody that's on this specific team because they will have a more hands-on approach to the recruiting and they'll be able to know what to do um, with your application from there. And like I said before, or this tagline, when in doubt, reach out, this just means if you ever have any question about whether or not to send out an email, it's like, oh, Greg, I don't think that's necessarily the right person. Or, oh, you know, maybe they don't have the exact job that I want or something like that. It's like, well, who cares? If they don't respond, then they don't respond. And you can just document how much how that's like how hard you tried. Or two, um, if, if they do respond, you can do an informational interview. And you can get that much more knowledge gain about the industry that you're curious about or something like that. So when in doubt, reach out. <laughs> and then the goal for, uh, for this one is you want to get your story in the right hands. So this is alluding to the content that's in your email, but basically you want to get your pitch into the hands of the right person, whether it be a technical recruiter or somebody on the team. And 
a huge, huge takeaway here is you got to make everybody's job e easier. Once you send out the email to the right person, you get one shot, if that, to leave your mark. You have to make it easy on this gatekeeper. And what I mean by that is you have to make sure your email pitch is short, sweet, and ready to get passed on to the next staff. Now, I want to go over the content of what my email pitch looks like. I'm going to give you guys my email pitch that I used to reach out to you know, those 105 different emails um, for those guys. First paragraph was a quick intro. Name, background, name of the school that I attended, link to my, link to my program for the alumni, and saying that I'm a data scientist. Basically, I'm letting them know who the heck I am, where I'm coming from, and I showed them a link to the alumni because they had some cool alumni that were working in awesome spots, and I wanted to have the recruiter look at those alumni in different locations, and then it would give a little bit of an authoritative voice to galvanize in general. So if I linked to alumni, and they saw that they were working at Tesla and Airbnb and LinkedIn and all these things, I wanted the recruiter to know that it was a reputable program. Next, after my quick intro, I was going to go into my final project. So when I say final project here, this could really be any project that you have. I um, had a project, I put it up online, and I wanted to share a link to it to these technical recruiters and to these um, different um, team members, and I wanted them to see my project and let my project do the speaking for me. So it was a little bit of work that was on there, and I made it look good and all that good stuff, and I just threw it out there so people could go explore it if they wanted to. And finally, my last paragraph was always the express interest to learn more. So I'm excited to learn about interesting problems at XYZ or whatever they're working on. I'd love to find out more about the data team. You notice here that I'm not asking about a job. I'm not saying jump on the phone screen. I'm not, you know, forcing them to do anything for me because they get the they get the pitch. It's like, let's be real here. We're all humans. We all get what's going on here. The object of this game is to not seem too needy, but rather that you're interested in hearing more about what's going on and that you're a valuable asset here. Uh, and then also, I did a lot of A/B testing for my subject lines. And you might not think it's that big of a deal, but when you're a technical recruiter and you're getting 200 emails a day from random people, you uh, start to notice which uh, subjects work the best and which ones don't. And what I found out works easiest for me is introduction, space, dash, space, my last name. So introduction, camrad. Because now the technical recruiter or whoever is receiving this email is kind of like, oh, an introduction. Oh, I wonder who I'm getting introduced to. And so if, if you're getting introduced to somebody, it usually implies that you're getting introduced to um, somebody you want to be introduced to. It's not, the subject line isn't, you know, job candidate seeking job, because then they already know it's a pitch, and they haven't even read your email yet. So introduction dash camera worked the best for me, and camera is my last name, if that was a question. Um, and then finally, the other thing, too, is you have to understand that if you're sending out, say, like 10 emails per company, chances are you're not going to hit the right person. and But, however, that person is going to forward off your email to a technical recruiter or to a data member to see, or to a person on the technical team to see if they want to find out more. So the, the huge, huge hint here is you're going to be forwarded. And so knowing, knowing that you're going to be forwarded, what information do you need to include in your email pitch to ensure that the person who you're getting forwarded to has all the information they need to do their job? Think about it from their think about it from their perspective. Uh, final project, so just don't even need to call this final project. But if you're going to be displaying some sort of project, I found out that a visual project is always better than a text-based project. Is always better than a code-based project because honestly, nobody's going to read any code that you have unless they're getting really deep into it. Nobody really wants to read any text, like three paragraphs of text. But it's pretty easy to digest a visual representation of you know, whatever the heck is you're trying to describe. And so visual usually worked out the best for me. And you can keep your co keep your project up on GitHub if you want, but I found out that a web presence works out best for me. Um, you want to make it easy for others to digest. And the project, if you think about its actual purpose, um, any project that you'd ever do is to display that you know what the heck you're doing is basically what it is. It's a validation that me as a data scientist or me as a web developer has the skills to put together something. Not only has the skills to put together something, but the initiative to put together something. So think about what a web presence does for your specific project. It actually does a whole lot. 
And um, I know that the data, data scientists, they're not very uh, we'll call them web savvy people, so we just always use Bootstrap, which is really easy for us. And then once I had my project, I promoted the heck out of it. So I was going on data, Reddit, data is beautiful, Reddit, data science, blogs, news, newsletters, Twitters, Hacker News, Data Tao, all over the place. Uh, if you have a project, go promote it everywhere, man. There are blogs that are begging for um, material to send out to other people. I think I pitched it to three blogs and two of them said, yeah, it looks cool. Let's put it out in the next subject or next edition. So don't be afraid to share your final project anywhere. And like I said before, the purpose of a final project is you want to let your work do the talking. So what's cool about a project, if it's up online, up on the web, it's going to sit there, and it's a very passive way for people to learn about you and for people to reach out about you. I was actually shocked, but one, during promoting my project, I had people contact me just off of finding the project online and wanting to talk about it. I didn't even have to reach out to them in the first place, which was very cool to see. Cool. So let's say you got past the project, you got past all that stuff, the gatekeeper says you're good to go. How can you most efficiently convey your skills to the technical recruiter or to a team member or to a hiring manager? The main takeaway here is you have to step into interviewer's shoes and you have to do prep because there's no excuse to not be doing your prep beforehand because in the interview process, there's not much that you can control, but you can control the level of preparation that you do. First of all here, there's no excuses. Like I said before, you can control how much preparation you do. There should be no excuses as to why you're not prepped for something. Next, recruiters are your friend. I don't know why this was such a big uh, knowledge game, but uh, blow my mind moment for myself when one of the people at Galvanize just said, look, a recruiter's job is literally to put, a, to fill in job wrecks. They literally want to get you a job. They want to maximize the success of their candidates because if they fill a bunch of roles, then, they look, then they, they look great. You have to think about what their motivations are. They want to fill these roles. So what I do is, is before every job interview that I had, whether it was with a team member or whether it was with a hiring manager, I contacted the recruiter and I said, hey, I'm about to go on the phone with XYZ. What can you tell me about them? What is their work style? What kind of things are they interested in? And the recruiter was always, always very, very receptive to that. And they always wanted to jump on the phone with me. And they always wanted to tell me more about my specific situation. So if you're ever about to do a, uh, an interview, whether it's in person, especially if it's in person, but if you're ever going to do an interview, for the love of God, surprise yourself and ask the recruiter, how can you best prep for this interview? You'll be amazed as to the knowledge gain you'll have from an insider's perspective. Next, before I interviewed with anybody, I always looked them up. Do, do they have a blog? Do they have LinkedIn? Do they have articles? What are their interests? What are the tech stacks that they use? You're like, Greg, tech stacks? What do I care about what tech stacks do they use? Well, if they're answering me a question, if they're asking me a question about how I completed a project, if I can drop a common tool, and by drop I mean if I can name drop a common tool that we use together, then they could see that I'm a regular person. They can ask me about that specific tech stack, and they could know that maybe we could bond, not bond over it, but maybe we can have a point um, of commonality between the two of us. So like, so I saw some on somebody's LinkedIn that they loved using IPython notebooks. I specifically mentioned during the interview with that person that I loved IPython notebooks and this is how I used them, X, Y, Z, and it was a great point that we could talk over, which is awesome. And then finally, questions are golden. <coughs> so what I would always do People always go, Greg, I don't know what questions to ask. I don't know anything about the company, blah, blah, blah. It's like, again, there's no excuses. That's a lame excuse for, for not being able to prep. What you do is you go and Google the company, and you see the latest news articles about that company. So what, say it's Instacart. I'm going to Google Instacart news, and I'm going to see what are like the recent TechCrunch articles about them, or what is going on. Did they just acquire a new company, or did they just hire somebody new or something like that? Either way, it's... I can ask how the specific team that I'm interviewing for relates to that piece of news. So, for example, Salesforce had acquired um, you know, a, a tempo, it was a calendar app. And what I did was, is when I got into the interview, I asked the data science team I was uh, working with, I go, oh, I just saw that Salesforce attire, att acquired tempo. Can you tell me about if you've worked with their product at all or if you helped with that acquisition? And even if they say no, what I've done is I've communicated that I've done my prep 
and that I'm smart enough to know exactly, um, I'm smart enough to at least give the initiative to show that I'm researching and preparing for this interview. And, it, and so even if they haven't worked with them and I don't get the answer that I want, I've still conveyed value in that message. Um, and then if you need more uh, questions to a specific, specific interviewer, an easy one that I always do is once you looked at their LinkedIn, you can see their previous job history, obviously. So if they've gone from, you know, say a marketing role into more of a product-driven role, you can say, hey, how was the transition into marketing from product? I'm curious about it. What did you learn from it? And people love talking about themselves, and so they'll love talking about their transition. Goal, no surprises, be prepared. Um, interview key points. So the common questions that you're always going to get asked no matter what is tell me about your background. That's the most standard, does this guy have a pulse, does this woman have a pulse question that there is. Next one that is very, very common is why us or why our data. So why do you want to do web development for us? Why do you want to do data science for us? What makes our backend infrastructure interesting to you? Or why would you ever want to work for us, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the other thing, too, is I talk to a lot of people on phone screens, and th they get nervous. And it's natural to be nervous during an interview. It's 100% natural. I get it. I get nervous myself. The way that I always got myself unnervous, or at least tried to, was opening the phone call lighthearted. And what I mean by that is the person is always calling you, and they say, hi, is this Greg? Uh, yes, this is Greg. Hi, Greg. This is blah, 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 blah from company XYZ. And I say, oh, how's it going? They go, good. How's it going? I go, something like, oh, the weather is great today, or something where, you know, you're working really hard doing something or X, Y, Z, or, you know, something out of the ordinary, because then it loosens you up, it loosens them up, and it gets the call in a lighthearted tone, which is awesome, and it makes everyone feel better. Um, the next is when the recruiter goes, so what are you looking for? The person that says, I'm down for anything, um, Unfortunately, it, it doesn't sound awesome. It's not, you don't really ever want to say I'm down for anything. Because then I'm kind of thinking, well, I don't want somebody who's down for anything. I want somebody who's down for what the job that um, I'm advertising right now. That's what I want. I don't want a generalist in here. And the person says, okay, well, I'm kind of just, you know, general all over the place. I kind of want to go this direction. That's better, but it's not 100% great. If you have a direction that you want to go, display the direction you want to go. What I want to, what I, the point I want to emphasize here is back to like that faking aspect that we were talking about before. A lot of people say they're down for anything because they want to be open for anything. They're afraid to say that they're in a sharp direction or they have an interest or a goal. But I tell you what, if you don't have that interest or the goal in that job, then one, the job isn't going to be very satisfying. But two, the technical recruiter is going to see that and they're going to weed it out and they're not going to want to move forward with your application in the first place. So don't be afraid that you don't have a sharp general direction, or um, don't be afraid to say that you have a general direction, at least. Um, and then next is, it's okay to not know the answer to something. Don't panic. The, my number one deflection thing that I always said, if I didn't know a question, there's things that were over my head, absolutely. And instead of saying, I don't know, which sounds... Um, I mean, which the question is a test in itself. Can he answer a question? If not, can he understand what steps he needs to do to answer the question? So I'd say, you know, that's an awesome, interesting question. I'd love to do more research and get back together with you and answer. They got that I was saying no, but they also got that I was prepared enough to say to deflect the answer instead of saying I don't know. Next is I would always kind of rewrite my resume. I wouldn't literally rewrite it, but I'd reread it before every interview because there was always, you know, on your resume you have sub bullets and little points. There might be, you know, 30 different points on your resume. And I'm not going to remember all those if I read my resume two weeks back uh, and I'm talking to somebody. What I need to do before every interview is I need to look over my resume and I need to get fresh with my own background. So I could say, oh yeah, that's right. I did do that project where I led this team, did this blah, 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 blah. And so then when they ask about it to me on the uh, interview, I'll have it fresh on the top of my mind. Because when you're in your interview, you'll have your resume in front of you, yes, but you're going to be so nervous and spazzing out, or at least I was, that I can read my resume as I'm trying to answer and think on the fly. And so having it on the top of my head was great. Um, and the goal, effectively deliver your prep preparation. Because you've done all this prep, let's effectively, effectively deliver it. Deliver it.
Um, cool. And so lastly, as we're talking about hard creative energy, when I was making this presentation, I avoided using the words uh, hustle or like ninja or rock star or anything like that. And I thought, what is it really that I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say that one, you need to put in hard work, but you need to put in creative work. And so it's creative, hard energy is what it is. Get creative and put in a lot of really hard energy. Uh, so after this, um, I'll hook up with Eric and I'll send off these uh, resources. We're going to get you a company list. These are the 120 companies that I sent out. Uh, the email and interview tracker for if you want to, you know, track all your emails and interviews. The cold template email intro, uh, cold email intro template that I gave everybody. I'll give you my resume that I used. I just made mine off of credible.io, which was kind of weird for me because coming from a finance background, I gave this really boring looking resume and because I thought that's what finance people needed to do and Credle has some really colorful ones which is awesome and then for all the interview prep that I had this is this all came from Galvanize so um, and yeah so I hope that you guys can use and improve this stuff for the next people that you use it for and I'd love to hear about what's working and what's not working in your job interview yourself and that's all we have right now that's awesome thank you so much I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have one or two questions lurking out there after that. Good, I hope so. I hope so. so um, just, just, just to reiterate on the question front, uh, if you are viewing, uh, you're welcome to use the Q&A app, which is the little, little uh, cyan colored icon uh, you have to sort of drop down a menu for, and we'll see that here. Or if you're right here, just unmute, say hi. Who are you and what do you want to know? I have a question. Um, first of all, Matt, thanks for presenting. That was really interesting. Awesome. Um, it's kind of a maybe a request, but could you give us like, well, I'm interested in what your final project was, and sure. maybe like you could use the language you used to talk to like recruiters or whoever to describe it to us. Sure. Absolutely. So my final project was. One sec here. My final project was, <clears throat> well, the pitch line was an exploration of the New York City taxi data set and finding out the distributions of where rides are getting dropped off. So basically, I took a look at every single block in New York City, and what was really interesting is you could see that some blocks, all the taxi rides got dropped off at late night. So these are people that were going out to the bars. Some taxis only got dropped off in the morning during the weekdays. So these are commercial places. And what's cool is if you visually represent that, um, you can get a really cool map out of there. So let me pop up this link for you guys. So I did that, but what I knew, like I said before, I knew that my website was going to get forwarded off to people. And I knew that, um, let me pop this over here. I knew that I needed my website to do the talking and that I was not going to have control over that over who saw it and when. So what I made sure was that it was self-service. It was ready to go. Um, so let me log in here. I say, well, let's do the link um, afterwards when I give you give you the rest of the goodies. But thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Cool, no problem. Hey, I have a question. Yes, sir. Hi. Who's hey. talking here? Uh, it's me. Uh, hi, I'm Adrian. Awesome. Uh, I was just wondering, after you landed the job, how hard was it or difficult was it for you to get acclimated to what you needed to do for the job? Sure, absolutely. So my dad at one point said, Greg, you don't get, you don't really understand what you're doing at a job for a year. And I was kind of like, Dad, what are you talking about? That's not true. And, you know, bless his heart, in actuality, the, for the first four months, you don't know what you're doing, I swear. And then four, month four through month eight, you finally start to provide some value. And then after month eight, that's when you're really starting to get into your groove. So if it feels like a long time, it actually is a while. Because, I mean, you've got to learn tech stacks. You've got to learn how people work. You've got to learn who people are. You've got to learn the email situation. You've got to learn how to book a conference room. <laughs> like, you've got to get your computer. You've got to get set up. There's a whole bunch of different things you've got to get acclimated to. Could I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, we spoke, uh, Greg. I'm sure, I'm sure you remember. We we spoke late last week, and yep, one yes, of sir. the things that uh, one of the things that I really uh, thought was very 
uh, interesting or profound from you was, was the emphasis on well, the way I'd put it is the emphasis on what we call the side door is another pipeline, right? Which is to say, you don't necessarily go into the front door by just going to the career page and, and going through a wizard, but like, like uh, what, the thing that I didn't get was that side door is its own pipeline. Like you reach out and create your own connections as opposed to using the ones that you just happen to know from your prior life, right? And uh, the interesting, the the question I have is in your presentation, it seems to be kind of like uh, technical recruiter heavy. Is is that? Um, I mean, it, are, are those the right people to reach out to? I mean, are are because those are people who are going to like try to funnel you into like their job portal or process. Uh, how do you how do you go out to like uh, reach out to people who maybe? Um, who aren't in that position, or do you feel like that's a good use of your time, or, or what, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. So what I told myself was, if I don't get the right person, either two, th two things are going to happen. One, they're just going to blow off my email and not even care, which is whatever, okay. Two, they are going to read my email and not do anything, which is fine by me, sort of. And then three, they're going to forward my email to the right person. You know what I mean? So it's almost like you're throwing your baseball to the cutoff man, and even though it hasn't reached second base yet, they're still going to throw it to second base, which is nice because I don't know who the heck the right person is for. Because usually how it works is there's one technical recruiter for a specific team for a specific job, and so even if you hit the wrong technical recruiter, they'll forward it off to the right technical recruiter because they know who it is. Now, even if you forward it off to a um, say a web developer or a data scientist. They might say, oh, shoot, I don't deal with recruiting. Let me forward this to the right person because it's their job to deal with this kind of stuff. So I kind of shot my arrow in the dark-ish towards an area. They took that arrow and they put it towards the right person. Oh, I have another small question. Yeah. Um, it's Adrian again. So in your resume, you called yourself a data scientist? Yes. Uh is my question is is there a big difference when you call yourself a data scientist versus uh, like a web developer sure absolutely so with those two distinctions absolutely not the point that I want to make with that data science um, talk there is that I had a big case of imposter syndrome as do a lot of other people and I was hesitant to call myself a data scientist because although I just went through this big boot camp I didn't feel like one because I didn't have any industry experience and one of the main points that was harped on us at Galvanize was like, no, don't feel that way. You, it's sort of fake it till you make it, but it's sort of ignore this Im imposter syndrome. Because honestly, when the technical recruiter looks at your resume for the five seconds they're going to look at it for, they don't want to see, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to see somebody who's not a, a bona fide person in the industry that they're trying to get in. So if you're trying to become a web developer, call your, you're, you are a web developer. You have this training and you have this experience. Don't think anything otherwise. If you're trying to become a data scientist, you are a data scientist. You know, like, nobody's, like, if somebody wants to say, that, Greg, I want to become a data scientist, but I'm not one right now, it's like, well, I mean, what do you want me to do for you then? You know what I mean? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Actually, there's a, a related question in the text, which is, um, how, do you, how do you handle applying for positions that require two to three years of experience? Awesome, absolutely. So, if a position requires two or three years of experience, this just means that the top of the funnel is just going to shrink just a little bit more, that there's less jobs that you can actually go out for. But I would attack it the exact same way. You know, instead of, instead of um, targeting, you know, intro to web development roles, now you're going to go, you know, experience web developer roles or something like that. Or, you know, just kind of redirecting your uh, scope. But honestly, I'd, I'd go about it the exact same way. And and so were, were you were you actually applying for roles that were sort of beyond your your, your years of experience? You know, honestly, this isn't this isn't a great answer to that question. But I wasn't really applying applying for roles to be honest with you. I, I wanted to show you guys this. I'm going to share my screen one more time. Uh, I, li I like that distinction a lot. Yeah. Um, here is my outbox. I just searched the email intro, the subject that I was looking at, told you guys about, and you can see how many emails I sent out. Look at this. Delivery status failure. It's like I barely even I was guessing their email address. No response, no response, no response. Okay, here's a response, here's a response, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I'm sending out these emails. And 
the no responses didn't discourage me. Um, you know, all you know, all this different stuff. And so really, I wasn't really applying for roles. I was just trying to get my um, my name out there is what I was trying to do. And the worst thing that's going to happen is somebody's not going to respond. The middle best best case is you're going to get an informational interview. The best case is you're going to say, oh, shoot, let me go for a uh, phone screen right now or something like that. The best, the, be the, the lowest competition is for a role that doesn't actually really exist, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What else? Um, I have a quick question, Greg. Uh, this is Connor. Um, hey, Connor. Now, when you're applying to 105 jobs, or I, I guess sending um, emails to 105 people, yep. and then you know you eventually get to the point where you start sending out your resumes to these individuals that responded back and are interested in you. Do you gear your resume differently to the job, or do you spend time on reformatting and making sure that it fits that specific company? or that specific role? Because, you know, not all roles are, you know, they're general, but they might be a little bit different. You know, like maybe one's more uh, on the Ruby side, you know, you yeah. know, a backhand stack, or maybe one's going to be on the, you know, user experience stack. You know, it, 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 do you kind of, like, base it off of what you're applying to, or? Absolutely. So the – I love that you asked that question because I agree, man. It takes a lot of work to reformat your resume to every job you're applying to and every single person. It takes a lot of work. What what I've come to find out is that um, a lot of LinkedIn profiles will get searched based off of keywords. A lot of resumes will get filtered based off of keywords. And so I went for more of the generalist resume rather than trying to specifically cater um, each individual resume to each individual job. What I will say has more effect is when you send out the email to the person, catering that a little bit more has more ROI than catering the resume. I say that because you don't know if your resume is going to get read, but chances are whoever's looking at your email is going to give five seconds to your email. And if you can um, make that pitch more effective, then you'll uh, do better for yourself there. Thank you. I have a question also. Uh, my name is Chris G. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, when it comes to uh, catering your your resume, um, if you had jobs, say, 12 years ago, you know, working at Whataburger or whatever, would that be something you just lop off and just do something that's relevant in the last X many years, or just er er all kind of experience that you had before? Sure, absolutely. So if it was 12 years at you know, Whataburger, I, yeah, I'd give that the boot for sure. I um, how would I want? How would I put this? Usually, you just want to show the experience that, like, maybe the top top two positions or top three positions that want to closely identify with your industry. Now, if you look at some director at a corporation, he'll have three pages worth of a resume because he's done something industry specific for his entire life. If you look at people coming out of boot camps like myself in a transitional phase, our experience won't always cater to what we're actually trying to go after. So what I would do is I would highlight my finance my finance experience, but I would um, emphasize the technical aspect, whether I was querying a database or whether I was presenting to external stakeholders or whether I was managing a project or something like that. I was trying to highlight the skills that could transcend industries and would more focus on a specific job. Um, on, I'm sorry transcend industries and transcend jobs, but would more focus on me being a good employee and a good, um, you know, a good worker like that. But if it's, you kind of want to be a little strict with yourself if it's not super industry specific. Now the next natural question from there is, well, Greg, I don't have anything industry specific. Then take your prior experience, whether it's two or three jobs, and highlight the things that kind of transcend, transcend industries or transcend jobs. Just a couple, couple quick ones for me as well. Um, did, so you weren't sending out your, just to be clear, you were not sending out your resume attached to your initial batch of emails. You know, actually, I, actually I was. Um, okay. And I think about, so what I'm going to do, so what I'm going to do, Eric, what's the best way for me to give you these three documents that I can? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll reach up and I'll reach out to you uh, afterwards, and then when we awesome. do the transcript of this, I'll post it up on the blog as well. Awesome, that's great. So let me, um, I'll tell you what. 
me throw it here real quick just so the students can, you know, jump on and take a look at it, and then I will. So there's a whole bunch of, I just chatted, a whole bunch of company list, email tracker, and then the last one is the cold email intro. And from there, you can see the words that I used. Um, and I would attach my resume, actually, to that, um, to the email, because my thought process was, you know, they're going to drop off once by just looking at my resume, I mean, looking at my email. I don't want to have to have them go through another mm -hmm. drop-off point by responding back to me and me getting it to them or whatever. Got it. And so um, maybe, maybe this is actually a good one to, to, to go out on, but... In all, one offer, how many hours <laughs> of hustle, work, yeah. whatever you call it, thought, sure. pain, suffering, and, and betrayal did you go through to, to get yeah. to that one offer? Well, so I tell you what, I, uh, it got to the point when my friends were going out on a Friday night, and I, I, I told myself, I go, look, man, you don't have a job. Why would you go out to the bar and, like, why, when you don't have your goal? I mean, you don't have your goal, so why are you going out? And it got to it got to that point where I was that de not desperate, but that motivated to do something. And it also got to the point where I was getting really discouraged after sending out that 40th email of the delivery failure notice or nobody responding, or having that phone screen where <laughs> I'm sure all of you guys will be able to relate to this at one point. You have a phone screen and you don't hear back from the person for a week. And you think, oh, maybe they just forgot to follow up. It's like, no, usually if you don't hear back for a week or two, it's usually not a great sign. <laughs> and I would get really discouraged. And um, so there was hard times, there was ups, there was downs. But I tell you, once you get the job and once you're happy where you are, that makes it all worth it. Um, but let's put it this way. So a month, four weeks, I had to take one day off for myself. Um, so six days, 24 days, eight hours a week. So like 100. 40 hours, 160 hours, or whatever. And that's yeah. that's how, that sounds low end. If if you're yeah, and that and that's and that's low end. I think so. I, here's another data point too. There was 16 people in our cohort that were eligible for the job, and I was the fourth one to get one. So I was a little bit on the earlier side. But there's students that were out there. You know, it took you know two or three months to you know grab a job after that. Um, but they would always ask, you know, Greg, you know what what can I be doing? And I say, all right, let's take a look at your email pitch. How many emails have you sent out? They go, well, I haven't sent out that many. It's like, well, let's 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 talk about let's get some energy in here. Let's start working towards it and let's help you out here. Hit it hard. I, yeah. I have a small question. Sure, right. please. All right. Um, so you went through Viking Code. Uh, how many, or how much did you refer to it? And, or talk about it when you were doing your interviews, just wondering. Sure. So actually, I, d I didn't attend Viking Code myself. I attended oh. It's called um, Galvanized Data Science Immersive. But I, what, I, what I saw is that I um, could relate a lot to these technical boot camps. And I s whenever I would talk to students, I would see myself in them. And so I always wanted to talk to more people. So I reached out to Eric, and he said he thought it would be a good idea. And that's how I got in front of you guys today. So um, I think we're we're actually down at the end of our time here, and I want to cool. be want to be respectful of your time as well. Um, awesome, Greg. Thank you so much. This is awesome. I think Absolutely. that this this aligns very well with with the way that we also kind of approach this this whole this whole job search. Um, but you've also provided a lot of really interesting things that that I think could be helpful for anyone out there. Um, I, I won't even begin to list them off because it, <laughs> <That's laughs> it's, it's really you, awesome Greg. stuff. Awesome. Thank you very much. So thank you, um, thank you everyone else who's who's here joining us as well. Um, it, this is this is the Viking Codecast regular series with uh, with professional developers and others in in the industry. So uh, please join us next time. And otherwise, uh, Greg, thank you again, and I hope everyone you have a great night. Bye.